Welcome everybody, I am Thomas DeMar and today I'm going to be showing you how to do easy cordials. It's a very simple process, but before we get started, one of the first things that we're going to need to do is to wash our hands. So whenever we're preparing food for other people, we always make sure that we are going to be washing our hands. Make sure that any of the tools that you use are freshly washed as well, your cutting board and your knife and stuff like that. You don't want anything from a previous uh, adventure stuck to your stuff. Wash that off. All right. So today I'm going to be talking about doing easy cordials. Now, unlike the youth cordials, these are alcoholic. Uh, these are based loosely off of a lot of recipes that you will see in medieval times, but it's not any specific recipe. There's many different ways to do this. Really, these are just fun, easy cordials that everybody can do. You don't have to have a lot of space uh, to be able to make these at all. You don't need a lot of equipment. It's surprisingly simple to do. Uh, this is something that you can just set it and forget it for a while and then you come back and it's really good to taste. And it's also a great way to bribe or to reward your friends for helping you out at events uh, or for siding with you in a war or something like that. So there's a lot of ways that we can have fun with these. Uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to start off with our base uh, distilled liquor and that is going to be brandy. Now, a lot of times in medieval times, what they were using was a brandy, which is distilled from a wine. Uh, it is perfectly acceptable to use vodka, to use uh, rum, any uh, distilled liquor that you would like to, but traditionally it is brandy. That's what we're going to be using today. Although, if I'm doing something with a fruit flavor that uh, is a little mild, shall we say, uh, a lot of times vodka is a really great way to go because vodka doesn't have a lot of its own flavor that's going to overwrite the fruit that you're trying to get the flavor out of. But we're going to start with brandy today. And what I use is the good old cheap stuff, right? So this is just, you know, it's for a bottle this size, it's 20 bucks off the store shelf. Uh, you can use a smaller one, but we want to make sure that whatever you choose, you're going to be able to get a quart. All right, because we're going to start off with a quart of your brandy. Now, it doesn't have to be anything special for brandy because, let's face it, we're going to be changing it. So the flavor profile is going to be different from what you start out with. So you can spend money on some really expensive brandies, but really, in my experience, there hasn't been any difference in how much we enjoy the beverage when it's done. So we're going to start off with measuring out one quart of our brandy. Now the base recipe for this is very simple. We're going to be doing one quart of brandy to one cup of fruit to one cup of sugar. Those are the only ingredients that you have to have. It's very, very simple. And a lot of recipes, for, uh, especially for period brews, don't even require sugar. That's something that more or less we do in modern times for flavoring. Uh, but a lot of times what they are really is we're just infusing flavor from what we're putting into the alcohol and changing the flavor profile of what we have. Now to do a true period recipe, we would be also distilling um, the wine ourselves to make the brandy. However, in modern times, we don't all have a distilling license to do so legally. So therefore, we go to the store to get what we need. So let's see, there we go. We have there's a quart. Now I got one of the big bottles just in case. Um, I will say that usually the, the next size down bottle is just under a quart. So you might be a little surprised if you didn't have quite enough. So that's why I always get the big bottle. And now I've got this left over. I can enjoy it myself or I can use it for another brandy with uh, different proportions. Uh, if you run out, um, so say I've got this and I want to make another cordial. I don't have enough brandy in here. I can always grab another brandy. It doesn't have to be the same type, and you can mix them together. Uh, sometimes we've actually mixed rum right in with it, um, or, or vodka. You can mix them. <coughs> um, so you just take care of that that way. I am going to wash my hands again. So you can mix your alcohols as much as you would like, but we're going to stick with just a simple brandy today. And as I said, we're just going to do one cup of sugar, and that's granulated sugar you buy at the store. 
and then a cup of fruit. I'm actually going to be adding more than one cup of fruit. There's nothing that says you can't. Uh, it's just more or less a minimum. So I'm going to be doing some apples, some strawberries, and then I'm going to put a little herbs in there as well. All right. Now we got that all clean again. So I've got my brandy measured out. That's ready to go. And then what I've done here is I've got these apples. I don't bother peeling them. All right, I just core them and slice them. And then I put them right in. The apple peel sometimes actually will help with the color. It will change the color of your uh, drink, depending on what you're doing. Um, but it's not a big problem. And then for the strawberries, these are just actually frozen strawberries. These are a little bag I had left over in the freezer. So I figured, why not? Let's just throw it in and see what happens. I actually prefer to use frozen fruit. Um, I'm just cutting these down in half just to uh, increase the amount of surface area. Because these are frozen, we're breaking the cell structure down. So that we're actually getting more flavor for the same amount of berry that we have going in. And that goes for any fruit. <coughs> so if you freeze them, uh, you're going to get more out of them. I prefer it that way. It makes it easier to get uh, a stronger profile out of that. But there's nothing that says you can't use fresh either. Uh, a lot of times with period recipes, I assume that they're talking about fresh, not a preserved uh, fruit of some kind, which also tells me when looking at a recipe what time of year I might want to do it. When was the fruit that the recipe is calling for? When was it actually you know, in harvest? So now we've got those cut up. Put that in there. So I've actually got uh, about two to two and a half cups in there. So that'll be fine. He said, you don't want to go any less than one. The standard is one cup. And then what we're going to do is we're actually going to put it in a jar like this. So this is just a flip top. It's got that rubber seal on it right there. Uh, this is great to use. Being clear, we can keep an eye on it throughout the whole process. You can also use just a mason jar, just like this here with a lid on it. Um, so we're going to go ahead. We're going to put the fruit in. Now, apples that I'm using are pretty mild flavor. Uh, Granny Smith, will, they're stronger, they're a little more tart. But apples tend to be a pretty mild flavor overall. <coughs> Therefore, I, I wanted to use a little bit more of them to try and get more of that apple profile through. Uh, and then with the strawberries, they can come across pretty strong. So you actually don't need as many. And I was just using up what I had. So we had about two and a half cups of fruit for this one. Now for a little something that's fun, I like to put a little bit of herbs in as well. So here what I've got is I went to Hanford's and I got these in little uh, vacuum sealed packages and this here is actually sage. So it's got a nice aroma to it. Um, I think with the apple and the strawberry it's going to give it a nice overall flavor. A lot of times when you add herbs like this, you're not going to taste it when you first take your sip. You're going to feel it more on the back of the mouth, um, at, on the back of the tongue as well. So it's something that will, will come on the back of the flavor, not something that you should necessarily have to taste right at the beginning. So I'm going to go ahead and this is just about two sprigs. Just going to go ahead and put those in. Put those in the jar there. There we go. So now we've got those. We've got our fruit, our apples, our strawberries, and our sage in there. And then we're going to go ahead and add our sugar. Now I haven't added the brandy yet. I'm waiting for the final part of the process to do that. So next. Here I've got a cup of sugar already measured out. We're going to go ahead and put that in. There we go. And once we have that, I'm going to go ahead and pour this in.
The nice thing with putting the sugar in last is that the liquid is going to go right over top of it. It's going to help dissolve it right into the whole thing a little bit easier if you just put the sugar in first and then you add in your brandy. It's all going to sit at the bottom and just be a chunk that's going to be a little bit harder to stir up. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and put the top down on that. You kind of see how that's separated out there. So now what we're going to do, now that I've got this sealed up, is we're going to go ahead and we're going to shake that up. That's why having a seal on a lid is very important for this. All right, and it's going to remain cloudy. You can see the sugar is already starting to settle back out. A bunch of it is. Not all of it will. A bunch will. So at this point in the process, you're going to put it on a countertop or in a cupboard somewhere. Uh, the trick is not to leave it in the sunlight. We don't want to put it in direct sunlight. Um, so what we're going to do is I'll put that on a shelf and we're going to let that sit for at least four weeks. You can go anywhere from four weeks to, uh, I usually go up to eight weeks actually myself. I get a stronger pro profile out of it. The longer you leave things in, generally speaking, the stronger those flavors that you're infusing will come out. Um, it doesn't always work out that way, but as a general rule, that's pretty safe to assume. Uh, so after that, what we're going to do is you're going to keep stirring this uh, about once a week. All you got to do, because that sugar is going to keep settling down at the bottom, so all you got to do is just do that a little bit, get it stirred back up again. And then put it back and do that at least once a week until the sugar is all dissolved in and then you're just letting things settle out. Now, the fun part, we get to go ahead and put this in a bottle so that we can drink it. So what we had to do is a couple things first. We're going to grab some cheesecloth and you're going to put at least two layers of cheesecloth because you do have, uh, like with the strawberries, they have these little tiny seeds on their skins. So there's little things we want to try and keep out when we uh, siphon this over into our uh, finished bottle. So what I usually do is I'll take the uh, cheesecloth, I'll do at least two layers, sometimes four. I'm gonna put it right over the top of this and then I'm gonna pour this right into another jar like a mason jar, right? That's just gonna filter out, it's gonna leave all the product behind in here and all of the liquid you're gonna get separated out. But you're not done filtering yet. So what's going to happen is, after you've gotten to that point in the process, we have it in a jar. It's still going to be a little cloudy because you still have, it's a very thick substance and you might have some pectins and some small seeds and stuff that escape through. So then we take a mason jar like this one. This one here is a uh, half gallon. This is a coffee filter. So just a regular coffee filter and then a rubber band. I just put this on the top and you see that there's this well right here just inside. So then what you're going to do is you're going to take that liquid that you just strained out. Now you're going to strain it through the coffee filter. What's going to happen is it's going to go very, very slow. The reason for that is we've added sugar. So it's going to make it a lot more uh, thick. It's going to be more difficult for it to pass through the coffee filter. But trust me, it is worth the time to do so. Otherwise, what happens is in your finished bottle, you're going to have a whole bunch of sediment piling up at the bottom, and so it doesn't look very appetizing. It'll be nice and clear on top, but anything left will filter out to the bottom. So by putting it through the coffee filter, we can get rid of about 70, maybe 80% of that. It's not 100%. You'll still get a little bit left at the bottom, but it'll make a big difference. So you're going to go through and you're going to siphon, or not siphon, but you're actually going to just filter it through this coffee filter. You may have to change this filter a couple of times. I usually go through about three or four to do one batch. Uh, it's worth your time to do this. Unfortunately, that's the time consuming part besides waiting the four to eight weeks uh, in order to strain this out. So once you have it in here and you're ready to bottle, I use a couple different kinds of bottles that I like to do for cordials. One of them is kind of the hip flask style that we've seen pop tops here. And you can kind of see a little bit of sediment kind of on the bottom. Not a lot, very minor. Um, so that's kind of what you get. The other thing I do is these are actually just business cards. So I actually print these out and then I just hole punch on the corner. 
And this tells me what it is, what's in it, especially in the SCA, if you're doing uh, things like this, we tend to give them out for largesse or for uh, thank yous, presents and stuff like that. We don't always know who's gonna be on the receiving end of our presentations. So if you put all your ingredients on here, it doesn't have to be the whole process, just your ingredients, then if someone has an allergy, they can look at it and know that, okay, this is safe to drink. Uh, otherwise, there are people who would love to try your stuff, but they just don't dare take that risk uh, because they don't know what's in there. So just make sure that anything you use in your batch is actually listed on your label so that anybody can see that. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy like this. This is just a business card that uh, my wife did the artwork for, and then we just print out uh, the title on it, and then we just handwrite all the information on it. The other kind of bottle that I like to use, you see a lot of these are your standard pop top bottles. And this is a different kind of label. So these were just little cardboard cutouts with a little bit of string tied on here because we wanna make sure it doesn't come off the bottle. Nothing worse than having a case of cordials not knowing which ones they are because all of these came off the bottles. So on one side I have the name of it and on the back side it's my name and the person who helped me brew it, which in this case was Eleanor Swift from the Catona Basing Stokes. This helps people track things down now, in this case, we knew exactly who was receiving it. We didn't need to give uh, any of the ingredients on it, so that wasn't a concern. But just a simple cardboard tag like this is enough to help you identify what it is. Uh, cordials stay around for quite a while, so you want to make sure that you don't forget when you start going through your box of stuff for the future, oh, what was this I brewed? I don't remember what's in this. So tag everything, please. It helps everybody. Now, there is one other way to make an easy cordial like this, and that is to skip the step of the sugar. Don't put the sugar in at all. Many recipes do not call for that at all. So what you can do is to actually use a simple syrup, which is one cup of water to a cup and a half of sugar. So what you do is you let your, uh, your brew is gonna sit without the sugar in that jar on your counter. When you're ready to bottle it, then once you've strained everything out and you've run it through your coffee filter, at that point, you're gonna take the simple syrup that you make and then you can mix it in and you put as however much of that simple syrup in as the flavor that you like. There's no right or wrong to it. So you can put as little or as much as you want into that uh, mixture. So it could be you know, uh, drier, it could be very thick and sweet. Uh, it all depends on what you like. I don't tend to do the simple syrup myself simply because by the nature of the fact that you are adding water and sugar, you're adding water. So you are thinning out your mix. Now, some people do prefer that. I'm just not one of them. I like mine a little bit stiffer. Um, so that's kind of what I do, but that is another method that you'll see many, many brewers use. Totally valid. Just make sure that you do that at the end of the process. Don't add your sugar to your original mix. And when you're in that step, right before you put things into the bottles, then go ahead and add that. And when I'm bottling, I don't use any fancy equipment. All I do is I just take a funnel, put it in the top of the pop top, and I just pour that right in. It's that simple. And it doesn't take up much room at all. You just set it on a counter. I'll be moving it off the stove and putting it somewhere else. You can see I got a lot of other projects going. I've got a mead that's going. I've got a keg that's getting uh, ready to be used. You know, we can take up a lot of room very quickly. But this is a project that anybody can do in any small space that they have, especially for those of you who love to live in your tiny homes. This is a great way to do it. I got a couple of friends that do that. You walk into their tiny home and they actually have a couple of these laid out across the floor up against the wall, just waiting for someone to come along and finish the process. So. It's an easy thing to do, doesn't take much time, and the combinations of possibilities are limitless. And there are a lot of period recipes you can use that use these exact same methods as well. And some methods are even easier. It's just a matter of order of steeping different ingredients. So check things out. You can always check out your local Brewers Guild for different recipes and sources to try and find new stuff to do. So until then, have fun and keep brewing.